Um, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Dr. Mickey McComb Kobza. I'm with Ocean First Institute, and I am here uh, with. <laughs> I'm in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Dr. Joe D. Torre, uh, also known as Dr. Deep Sea. We're just hanging out here by the state line, turning holy water into wine. Excellent. And this is Nick Kobza. This is my son who is here. Uh, where are we? So we are in Jules Undersea Lodge, and we are doing 100 days undersea uh, to do a lot of things. One of them is to talk to visiting experts, such as the doc here. So she's an expert in sharks, so I don't know much about sharks, except I'm really scared of sharks. Not really. No, but, that's fantastic. Yeah. And then we have two other people who are participating. Would you like to introduce yourselves, gentlemen? Of course. So hi, everyone. My name is Hayden Ramsey. Um, I'm a pretty experienced scientific diver, and uh, last weekend I got to spend some time down at Jules with Dr. Joe, so we're just here to talk about it. And this is my brother. My name is Hatcher Ramsey. I'm a junior in high school, also an experienced scientific diver through Junior Scientists in the Sea, and I also got to spend time down there with Dr. Deturi. Mm -hmm. That's great. And you guys also, I think, went out with Ocean First Institute, and you were able to do a little bit of work on sharks. That's right. That's right. A little bit is definitely a bit of a stretch. It was it was a lot. It was it was really amazing. It's an amazing experience for sure. Child labor laws. That's fantastic. That's right. That's right. We're going to go ahead and talk a little bit about that. So I think we're going to talk for about 10 minutes. I have a presentation to do. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and take questions um, in the chat box. So if you have questions along the way, um, I think we'll be able to have those in the chat box. And then we'll go ahead and answer those questions um, at the end of the presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, by sharing my screen. So bear with me for one second here, and I'm going to go ahead and get started. All right. So this is this morning. Um, so this morning, um, Nick and I were standing um, in Key Largo, um, right under uh, the, the sign for Project Neptune 100. Um, and we are now in Jules Undersea Lodge. Uh, so we went uh, with scuba equipment uh, down 25 feet and went into the moon pool um, and enter the habitat and that is where we are right now it's uh, eight o'clock at night in Florida and so it is dark out and so this window behind me is a window into the sea we're able to watch fish all day long divers uh, you name it uh, is swimming by the windows um, all day and night and so we've had an exciting afternoon here learning a little bit more about what it's like to live under the sea. Um, so I'm going to get started by telling you just a little bit about my organization. Um, so I'm the director of Ocean First Institute, and our mantra is that we protect what we love. And our mission is to preserve marine life through research and education. And uh, you might wonder why ocean research and education? Well, we believe in the future of youth, and we must have a generation of young people who are ready and committed to solving the issues of today. And so we inspire action and we empower explorers. We know there is no greater connection than the connection of people to nature. And so we take students out into the field and expose them to the natural world and to what science is and how valuable research is and why it's really critical for us to get out there to ask these questions and to learn how to really work on questions about conservation. And so this little fella here is a great white shark. We work uh, on sharks. That is our main research focus. And sharks are used in our organization as a hook to talk about all of the issues that are facing the ocean today. So uh, I am, have been a scientific researcher for over 20 years, asking questions about sharks, things like their biology, understanding their movements, trying to understand questions that help in their conservation. And so when we talk about sharks, it's really important to understand one thing, and that is that our universe is thought to be over 14, well, just under 14 billion years old, and our planet Earth 4.6 billion years old. And because we have water on our planet, we have life. And life arose and got big and interesting um, around 440 million years ago. And that's when we saw the rise of these bizarre sharks like Heliocoprion and Stethiacanthus. These are sharks that have world-like uh, teeth, 
and we have ones that have what looks like ironing boards on their backs. And remember, this is way before the time of the dinosaurs. Sharks are older than trees. So we think of dinosaurs, you know, as being ancient species. So sharks are closely related to animals called skates and rays. They collectively have cartilaginous skeletons and they are uh, known as the elasmobranchs. And because they've been on our planet so long, they have moved into nearly every aquatic habitat on the planet. So we see sharks in the brightly lit coral reef, we see beautiful rays like this in the muddy waters of the Amazon. We see sharks like the Greenland shark um, that has a lifespan of over 400 years living under ice in the polar regions. And then we see sharks like this frilled shark that lives in the deep dark ocean where no sunlight can even penetrate. And so when we study sharks, it's important to understand there are over 500 different species swimming in the ocean today including ones like the whale shark, uh, which is the biggest shark in the ocean. And you can see it swimming here. These are beautiful filter feeding sharks with polka dot markings. They're absolutely beautiful. They're the biggest sharks swimming in the ocean today, going, growing upwards of over 50 feet. Um, and you can see there, the smallest is the dwarf lantern shark. So this is a shark that can fit into the palm of your hand. And these are sharks that glow in the dark. So the velvet belly lantern shark literally um, glows. And then we have bizarre sharks like this, the hammerhead sharks. Hammerhead sharks are the most recently evolved sharks in the ocean and their heads are really their mystery. And um, so going ahead, talking a little bit more about hammerheads, again, the most recent shark to appear on our planet and have that amazing head shape. And it really is a mystery. We, we don't know much about it. Uh, but what we do know is that hammerhead sharks are critically endangered species, as are many sharks. And that's why we spend a lot of our time trying to find ways to conserve sharks, to preserve them, um, and try to give them a chance. And so one of the things I'm gonna to talk tonight about is white sharks. These are great white sharks. This is one in Guadalupe, Mexico, and it's giving us this behavior that we really don't understand. And I think this is so important because it shows that one of the most uh, icon iconic sharks, we still don't know a lot about it. And so one of the things that I do in my research is um, I do what I call baited remote underwater video cameras. So we drop cameras with bait to attract the sharks. And from those videos, we can learn the sex of the shark, the species of shark. This happens to be a great white shark investigating our, our camera off of Nantucket a few years ago. And so we have hundreds of these videos um, with sharks, allowing us to understand which one is which by their markings. Um, their length, and ultimately we're trying to figure out the abundance of these animals. And so you can see here, they all have different markings. We get really great shots, um, trying to understand more about them. And one of the other techniques we use is called environmental DNA. So every animal um, that is alive has DNA and that is unique to that animal, to that individual. And so we can collect water samples where we drop our cameras and we can then take that water, filter it, and we can actually find the DNA from animals in the area, including great white sharks. And that's one of the tools that we use um, to look at uh, the abundance and the presence of these animals. And so we filter the water, you can see the filter there. And then again, we're just looking at the sequence of a particular animal like the great white shark in our study, trying to really confirm the presence of these animals just with water, which is really incredible. And then uh, we have this year really started a great partnership with Marine Lab, and we started a shark research program down in the Florida Keys. And we've got two employees here with us tonight, um, which have been instrumental in helping us, taking um, students out into the field. Um, we had our two uh, students come with us in the field uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Here they are baiting hooks, throwing out hooks uh, here locally in the Florida Keys near Key Largo. And our goal was to catch sharks for an ongoing study that we're doing. We're looking at the health of nurse sharks and bonnethead sharks. And so here we are, we are uh, out fishing. And lo and behold, not long after that, uh, the, uh, we hooked a bonnethead shark, um, which is part of the hammerhead shark family. So you can see here, we've got the shark in a net, the boys are taking it in. 
and uh, they're going to put it down on the deck. They're going to put a little pipe um, in the mouth of the shark, which has flowing water. And then we're going to go ahead and draw blood. So the shark is on its back. And uh, one of our researchers is uh, gently taking a blood sample from the shark. And the reason for that is to help us understand the health status of these animals. We can look at hormones, we can look at health, we can look at everything through, um, through blood. So the blood is being drawn here, and then uh, we're able to put that into a vial, and uh, we'll take that to um, UM where we're gonna have different studies um, to look at things like pharmaceuticals, all kinds of different things. So we're really excited about that. And uh, we're, we're looking forward to seeing the results of the health panels on these sharks. And then we also collect um, other data. And this is really great. You can see here, um, this is one of our employees holding um, one of the bonnet head sharks, which is fantastic. Um, and after we um, do all of these things, we look at measurements, then we're able to release these animals back into the wild. Um, where they're healthy and, you know, we've really learned a lot from them um, without harming them. So it's really exciting for us to be able to do these studies. This is a nurse shark. Um, nurse sharks are benthic sharks. They lay on the bottom most of the time. And they're a really great study species because we can reliably get them. Um, and they are part of, you know, the uh, ecosystem here. And really, we're really excited to learn more about um, the health of nurse sharks here. And so this is our team. Um, you might be wondering, okay, well, um, how do I get involved here? Well, there's a lot of things you can do. Um, you can volunteer with us if you have the time. Um, we have a location in Boulder, Colorado, and we also have a location here in Key Largo. Um, you can also donate to us if you want to, um, which is wonderful. And we're also um, holding a shark field course. Uh, we have two courses in June. So if you'd like to come learn how to wrangle sharks and do a little bit of research with us, contact us and you can find out more. Um, and you can also visit our website to learn a little bit more about our organization. But we're really excited um, to be working um, down here in the Florida Keys with Marine Lab. But it's interesting, like a lot of the stuff you touched on is stuff that we have been preaching this entire time. So the good thing is we have a co-committant meshes. That's terrific. Kids, kids are going to rule the day. It's like the, the old folks, well, me, I'm the old guy, right? So the old guy is like, we're past an opening. You guys are the ones that are going to save the planet. You guys are the ones that need to get involved now. And if we can incentivize you to jump through it, that would be terrific. Um, you know, I mean, your, your message about conservation, preservation, protection, that kind of stuff, it's all terrific. It's all good news. And we certainly appreciate it. So, yeah. Hey, guys, what questions do you have when you have a shark expert? You definitely want to ask her questions. All so, right. So I'm not sure if we're going to see questions come up in the chat. How does that work? Um, so we've got our chat here and maybe um, We'll see if we can take questions in the chat. I don't see any yet. Uh, maybe Fane, if you can type in any questions that might be coming through, that would be great. Oh, here we go. You know, yeah, I can't see that. Oh, you hang on a minute. It says, um, okay, when did you start studying sharks? Um, okay, so uh, really I started when I was about seven years old. I saw the movie Jaws. And I was terrified of sharks, thank you very much, and uh, ended up reading about sharks. My parents had an animal encyclopedia and I devoured it. And so since that time, I've been really interested in sharks. I fell in love with them and I've been hooked for life. So, uh, and ended up getting a PhD and a postdoc and uh, started a nonprofit organization dedicated to ocean conservation. So it's really been kind of a lifetime journey for me. So I think I was eight years old. I saw the movie Jaws <laughs> in the movie theater, yep. in a drive through in the back of a Valare station wagon. Oh. And the, the, the station wagon floor was blue. And I remember being so oh. petrified of it. I didn't want my hand to go down in the, in the little hole in the bottom. But now it's like, oh, there's a shark. So cool. Look at, look at how blessed we are. Right. So it's amazing how your life changes as you grow old. Yeah. From fear to fascination. Fear to fascination. Okay. I there's love that. more here. Okay. What is your thoughts on the increasing number of orca shark encounters? What do you think is the cause for this? That's an interesting question because I was just in South Africa uh, in there's November. Smart. And we were tagging a great white shark because great white sharks are being displaced and they're abandoning sites that they typically have been in um, east of Cape Town. 
because of the presence of orca. So orca are killing white sharks for their livers. And we're trying to understand why that is and where those white sharks are going. So we were able to put on a pop-off satellite tag on a great white shark in South Africa. And we'll be figuring out where those animals are moving in response to that. Think about the intelligence involved in that. Hey, I know that you have something that I want, like a liver inside you. Like, yeah, you know, wow, that's a it's an interesting combination. It of, definitely uh, is. Um, what is what happens to the ecosystem when sharks are lost from a reef? Um, so that is another interesting question. So many times I'll talk about sharks and I'll talk about how. Um, we have wolves in Yellowstone National Park. They are a top predator in that system. And the removal of that, of those animals from that system caused changes even in the rivers and the river flow. And that was because vegetation changed because of the reduction of elk, which weren't able to graze onto the plants. And so it changed the system. So sharks are the wolves of the sea. And so when we remove sharks in great numbers, we're taking out an important part of the ecosystem that really is the part of the balance. And so we need a healthy ocean with sharks in it. It's critical. Um, okay, next is from Michael O'Toole. Hello, uh, question for Nick. So what is it like being in the habitat and was it difficult to get down there? The habitat? Here. We're in a habitat. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, what habitat? I was sleeping, I don't know. Oh, it's pretty nice down here. It was pretty easy to get down here. What was it like? Did you have to scuba dive? Yeah, we had to scuba dive up into the moon pool. But once we got in there, it was just, it was great. It was easy. And then did you go, did you go on an excursion out of here a little while ago with a big mask on? Yep. And were you able to talk to somebody? Yeah, it was a full face mask with comms built in it. I was able to use that to talk to people inside that. Yeah, so you were able to um, look into the window and you were able to talk to Dr. Joe. Yeah. Yeah. So fantastic. we did that. We did that live comms link. I put the uh, transducer here, able to talk through. We were able to talk really well. I don't think your comms were actually working. Mm -mm. Right? No. Uh, one of the other questions that just came up was, what did you learn about pharmaceuticals in the sea? Oh, well, we don't know yet. We're just doing a pilot study and uh, we'll be we'll be finding out uh, through some of the, the work that we've uh, some of the blood that we've already submitted. We'll, we'll find that out. So stay tuned. And uh, we'll let you know what we find out. We're really excited to, to learn more, for sure. So we're scientists and we speak from data, right? So that is the great answer for a scientist that speaks from data. From an ecology standpoint, the solution to pollution is not dilution, <laughs> right? Don't throw your drugs in the ocean. Don't, oh, <laughs> right? It just, it's going to make everything bad. And I mean, I, I'm not trying to be a conspiracy theorist or or be uh, be upset about it, but by God, you just can't throw your drugs down a the toilet. They're going to make their way to the ocean. You've seen Finding Nemo, all <laughs> drains go to the ocean, right? That's Come right. on, figure it out. Oh, so Gary Staub asks, uh, what can sharks tell us about the environment? And so really sharks are, are the wolves of the sea. They are the canaries in the coal mine. If you have apex predators like sharks, which are many times keystone species, meaning they have a disproportionate impact on all species in an ecosystem, we have to have sharks in the water. And that's why it's so critical. Right now, a third um, or more of sharks are threatened with extinction. So we can do better. And I think really making that connection to students, young people, scuba divers going in and making those direct connections, looking into the eyes of a shark that's what flips the switch and it gets people to go from fear to just falling in love with these animals and knowing how critically important they really are. Fear to fascination. I actually love that. And I'm going to steal that, by the way. <laughs> but, so, but, but I get that. And when you find yourself in the water with a shark and you're just like, that thing is so majestic. Like that thing belongs there. It flies, it turns, it banks. It's like a jet airplane. And you are like, you know, this awkward you know, kind of wobbling and making bubbles and everything. So, so you know, you're the intruder in their home. So it's just a thought, uh, just just respect that uh, that species in their home. Ah, so they asked, do I have a favorite shark? Well, I would say that's a really, it's a funny thing. It changes over time. Um, I'm a huge fan of hammerhead sharks though, um, only because they are so bizarre, weird. Their head shape is bizarre and they just, 
to me are incredible. Looking at a bonnet head shark, um, just yesterday we were out with bonnet head sharks uh, with our whole crew, our team, our, our tireless team that goes out hour after hour looking for these animals. Uh, they're beautiful. So I would definitely say that. And I love white sharks too, and tiger sharks. Yeah, they're, they're, it's hard. I it's like asking all. a mom to pick a favorite child. Which one of your kids is your favorite? Oh God, here we go. I like Bill. I like John. I like Frank. I, I really like Nick. Oh God, <laughs> I like them all. Um, what is the one thing to do that we can help our ocean? And you know, that's a great question. There's a lot of things you can do. Um, one of the things that we work on and that we've been uh, really facing are the fact that we're putting more into the ocean um, and we're taking too many things out. So we're taking out too many fish, we're taking out too many sharks, and we're putting in too much plastic pollution. Um, that's one of the other issues that we're working on. And so if there's anything I can say is think about what you buy, think about what you consume, think about what you eat. Um, you know, if you eat seafood, eat seafood responsibly, know where you get your food. Um, think about, you know, do you need to eat meat every single day, three times a day? Think about the things that you buy, that you, you eat. Um, it really does matter. Every single one of us can make a difference. And I know it may not seem like it sometimes, but we absolutely can. The things that we buy, the things we use, it's critically important because that drives businesses. And that's what really can drive change, um, immediate change. So definitely a great question. I appreciate that one. Keep in mind that one person doesn't have to do everything, but if every everybody does something, we will move the needle. And that's the point is to move the needle. Absolutely. Absolutely. A couple more here. Um, here's another one. Tell me about the diversity and wonder of shark eyes and how are they used to determine the view of the world? That cool. Is, was that a cool? Oh man, that was so, I learned a lot today. I'm learning about the focal point, the, fo <laughs> the ability for a shark to focus and Oh boy. So sharks eyes are truly amazing because they are as advanced as our eyes and they have mobile pupils, meaning they can control the amount of light going into the eye. And so sharks eyes um, really are magnificent. Uh, and again, when you look into a shark's eye, when you're diving, you really are looking back in time as to all of the things that have you know, that shark has experienced to be there that day at that moment, all of those adaptations um, in the environment that have shaped that animal at that moment. And it's truly an honor to be able to swim with sharks and to look into their eyes and to just imagine that incredible evolutionary history. And you said that some of them develop into keyholes, some of them develop yeah. into slits, some develop in like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 that's some pretty cool stuff. Like, because we think shark, oh yeah, shark, everybody yells and they go out. But when you take the time to look into a creature's eyes, how about the slanted retina? Yeah, so some stingrays have what are called ramped retinas. And so that's the back of the eye. Um, they have different focal points and that allows rays that are sitting on the seafloor to be able to focus on multiple points in, in, in the distance. And again, that is very helpful to them as they're looking out into the sand um, to be able to focus on multiple points. And so these are all adaptations that allow these animals to function effectively in their own environments, which is really amazing. And that's why there's endless questions to ask about sharks, skates, and rays, because they're so diverse. Some lay eggs, some give birth to live young. Uh, Again, just Sharks amazing. that lay eggs. Wait, what? <laughs> I, I literally, I took, I took a double take when she told me, I said, wait, 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 hold on a second. Sharks don't lay eggs. Oh yeah, no, actually they do. They do. Excellent. Well, do we have any more questions? I think we're good. Did we miss anybody? I don't think so. Um, let's see. Yeah, um, I, I have so many questions, Kit. So, Dr. McComb. Yes. Sorry, real quick. I didn't want to interrupt. Sorry. Um, there's the a Q and A tab as well as the chat, and there's a few questions in the uh, the Q and A tab. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. It would be fabulous if you could read those to us. Yeah, maybe you could. Oh, one. sure, sure. <laughs> uh, we are trying, the first one. I'm trying to get closer to this thing to read. And I'm going, <laughs> I can't read it. It's too small. I'm so old. Thank you. You need glasses and another pair of glasses and another. Yeah. Well, exactly. Um, I'm old. I'm old. <laughs> All right. So the first question comes from Beverly Reeves, and she asked, is shark finning declining? Uh, you know, that's a great question. Uh, and, and the answer is not really. 
uh, we've had a lot of campaigns that have tried to reduce shark finning, which is the act of cutting off the fins of a shark um, and the fins are sold um, for shark fin soup and they fetch a really good price. And so because of that, there is um, a, an illegal wildlife trade market for that and it, and it fetches billions of dollars. And so because of that, it is similar to you know, the African ivory trade um, in wildlife. And so it's something that is, is fought very hard against, but really the only way to stop that is to stop the buying. And yeah. so when people stop buying yeah. then, and there's no more demand, then it will stop. But as people continue to purchase those products and buy soup um, in the you know emerging middle class of Asia, um, where that demand is high, that's where we see that. So unfortunately, no. So I traveled to Asia and I did in fact see a can of shark fin soup and I was like, ah, oh, what the, you know, so you think to yourself, wow, it's actually still on the shelf. The good news is that particular can and every can that was in there was looking really old and lots <laughs> of dust on them. So that's good news. At least it's moving in the right direction possibly, but, but don't give up because you still got to outlaw it. You still got to stay away from it. You still got to be an advocate for it. So. Yeah. It's just the most horrible thing. It's the most horrifying thing. Yeah, but the good thing is there's a lot of educational campaigns and really yeah, to reduce sure. the demand is the answer to that. So thank, thank you for the question. All right, and the next one is from Monica Gosellen, I think. Um, have you had the chance to do any necropsies on the local species to see diet composition? Necrosis. Ne yeah, no, I have not. Um, I think that would be an interesting question, though, to look at stomach contents. I know for sea turtles and filter feeding sharks, um, we do know that plastic is part of the diet and that can, you know, impact the ability of these animals to feed successfully. So um, I would put money on that probably that is, you know, a, an issue, but it's not something that we've looked into. So I, I don't know, but it, it's a great question to ask. You can see plastic in the blood, right, though? Um, you I can imagine. do you can do plastic. Um, we have an uh, an FTIR machine. So that is something that we'll be looking into in the future. Um, it's just nothing that we've collected yet. Got it. All right. And the last so question that I see in that. No, microplastics are a big deal. So <laughs> that's yeah, right. We're working out all here. Thank you. Yeah. And the last question that I see in the, uh, the Q&A section is what kind of decompression process will you have to go, uh, go through when you leave the habitat? Yeah, I'm gonna let Dr. Joe answer that. <laughs> oh, you mean for you yeah. or for me? <laughs> well, for me. So, so for them, it should be uh, it should be pretty benign. Uh, they'll stay down less than or exactly 24 hours. They should be able to ascend to the surface. I would ascend very slowly. That's the advice that I give everybody. Now, mine is a little bit uh, you know a little bit crazy. So I'm using a uh, 3585 M value. If you know what M values are, uh, so I'm using that conservation. And when I do that and I do the math. They're all third order partial differential equations, 16 compartments. So there's a lot of math involved. The bottom line is I'm going to decompress the way that I've calculated it, which is about an hour in the habitat on Pure O2 and an hour swimming around at a more shallow depth on Pure O2. And then I also have my heart rate variability monitor, which just got patented, which is my patented design, which is going to check my autonomic nervous system for stress and should pre-warn me prior to any decompressive stress. Should, first time I'm using this for in a real life situation. And the answer is nobody knows. And trust me, Bill Hamilton might have been able to figure it out. He's gone. Bruce Winkie might have been able to figure it out. He's gone. So some of the diving greats are just gone. Those, those legends in math, they're uh, unfortunately not working anymore or not here anymore, not with us. So. Thank you. Um, so guys, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about your experience going out on the boat, handling sharks? You guys were the ones that we're handling the bonnet heads and the nurse sharks. Do you want to talk a little bit about what that was like? Yeah, so we got to go out with um, Ethan, Lauren, and Dr. Malinowski. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we got to handle yeah. three different nurse sharks and a bonnet head. Uh, which apparently we found Hi, Lauren. <laughs> we delivered pizzas Literally and Devin just left. walked in. <laughs> we were outside smoking a cigarette. They came in. No, <laughs> no, we were just outside. <laughs> okay, bye. Bye. So, uh, yeah, we got to do that work with them, uh, casting out hand lines, and like I said, brought back three nurse sharks and a bonnet head to um, 
from which we took fin clips, mu uh, muscle biopsies, blood samples, and a bunch of different measurements, um, as well as doing a cattle tag for each of them. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought it was really cool um, because Hatcher and I both do a lot of science diving. We don't know a lot about, or we didn't know a lot about sharks specifically. Mm -hmm. um, and that just kind of goes to show that like, you don't have to know a lot to start to become involved because we knew very little about sharks, knew very little about shark fishing. And in the same day, we went out in the boat and caught four of them mm -hmm. and uh, took all the data down and it, it was really rewarding the entire process. So it just goes to show how easy it is to get involved in stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I'm so glad that you were able to go out. Um, was there a highlight for you? Was your, there a favorite part that you experienced that day? Ab absolutely. So um, we we got to our site. It was like a 10 minute boat ride, if that five minute boat ride um, from where the boat was staying. And um, I tossed my line and there were uh, everyone was still kind of figuring out what we were doing. Hatcher and I were very new, awkwardly throwing our hand lines, kind of tangling stuff a little bit. And um. Within a minute, I felt something tug on my line. I kind of pulled a little bit, didn't feel a tug back, so I thought it was a rock or something just on the bottom. And then I started to notice the line moving a little bit. I turned around and I think I said it to Ethan. I looked Ethan right in the eye and I said, I think I have a shark on. And he turned around, he said, what? I was like, started to pull in. Yeah, there, there's a shark. I started to see it uh, splash up and stuff. And uh, that was just a wow, because we had kind of been conditioned. They were like, listen, catching sharks isn't super easy. You know, like we might be out here all day and we'll only see one shark, you know, it happens. But the second that line hit the water, there was a shark on. So it was just really, really awesome. It was a cool experience. Oh, that's yeah, great. And uh, my favorite part, um, I unfortunately didn't catch any personally. Um, so he's going to brag about that for the rest of my life. Um, <laughs> um, but my favorite part was Probably definitely holding out the sharks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but it's amazing to see how strong the sharks are because the ones we caught were just a, around or under yeah. a meter. Um, and it's amazing to see how, like, how much it takes to keep them, like, steady and just how, how like, pure muscle they are, how strong they are and how much they can resist what we're trying to do, even though we're really trying to help them. Yeah, you guys saw in, like, the images and videos, it was at least three people had their hands on this shark mm -hmm. just because they're super strong. And if they flip their tail one way and just ride out of your hands, then you got a shark loose on your boat. And it's, and it's a hassle to get it under control. So they're definitely really strong and you have to respect that. And how did it feel when you grabbed them? Rough. <laughs> Ridiculously rough. Like you look at them from the outside and they're just like smooth. Mm -hmm. But you grab hold of them, you're like, wow, okay, this yeah. is a rough like sandpaper thing. First time I grabbed a shark, I was like, oh, hi. Hey, okay. <laughs> Don't move too much, please. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. How about you, Nick? Did you have a highlight from, from the trip? On our, we, went out, uh, we went out with Nick shark fishing yesterday. Oh, I really, we, we, uh, saw a lot. We saw a lot of them. We didn't get any fights, but we sure saw a lot of them, which was really fun. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. That's great. All right. Well, I don't know if we have any other questions. Um, yeah, I think we're, I think we're good. Um, well, thank you so much, everyone, for, uh, being part of this, uh, Zoom webinar with us tonight. I hope you learned a little bit uh, more about sharks and, you know, certainly we would love for you to get involved with our organization or any other organization that's really focused on youth and conservation and getting, you know, people to connect to nature and, and to really understand that every single one of us can make a difference and every one of us really can uh, do something to make the world a better place and, and to work for those that don't have a voice. And that's why we're here. So, uh, from under the sea, we're going to be <laughs> under the sea. <laughs> uh, under the sea. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I said that I'm not <laughs> over that song, but I guess I'm not over it. No, it's all good. No, we appreciate you guys taking the time to tune in. And what great questions, man. Some of those were like real detailed questions. So thank you very much. All right, guys. From our house. Thank to you, everyone. Thank you. Be well. Thank you, guys. Bye. Good night. Bye bye. Good night.